my group regarding the concept of reciprocal inhibition. Okay? The old idea that when you're contracting an agonist, so if you're contracting, you're doing a bicep curl, you're contracting your bicep, that your tricep is supposed to spontaneously relax as it's occurring in order to not hinder the movement. That uh, concept has been proven and known to be false for a long time now. More specifically, the concept of reciprocal inhibition was actually a reflex that has been taken out of proportion. Re re reciprocal inhibition is a spontaneous reflex that occurs, but it has no static or lasting quality. In other words, for example, a lot of people think that if your psoas is tight and you have an inhibited glute, that by releasing the psoas, your glute maximus will spontaneously come back to life because you're playing with reciprocal inhibition. The concept of reciprocal inhibition has actually been disproven for many years now. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was back in the 70s, late 70s, when the studies were done to prove that reciprocal inhibition actually does not occur. And those studies were more recently um, uh, confirmed by some more recent authors back in, I think it was early 2000s. So on the blog, I think I've spoken about this before, where you can see that research. If not, I'll probably blog uh, this topic, this speaker next week, and I'll put the research on there for you. But that concept of reciprocal inhibition is an older concept that is now known to not really exist outside of the original reflexive quality that it had. Any questions about that? Yes. So we do some uh, isometric stretches, like knee compasses. Yes. I find I can get a, a release like if there's something else that's happening. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. The question was, when you're doing something like post-isometric relaxation, or in what we describe as PALES type 1, why do you get the contraction? Why does it lead into a release? What the studies have also shown is that when you do a PNF or a PIR type contraction, if I'm, if, let's say I'm stretching this person's muscle, I'm stretching a hamstring muscle, and I get them to actively contract the hamstring against me, and then I get them to relax. If I were to have EMG leads on their hamstrings, when I get them to relax, what would happen to the EMG reading on the hamstring? You would expect it to relax. That's how you gain that increased range of motion. Well, that's not right. What the studies show is that when you tell the person or cue the person to relax, you actually get an increased EMG output on, on, the, on the reading. Okay? So it's not like the tissue is actually relaxing. What's happening is your central nervous system is allowing you the range of motion to occur a little bit more. So it's saying, I will give you a little bit more range of motion to play with. So it's a direct decision by the central nervous system to allow you to stretch more. It is not a relaxation that's occurring. So once again, it's not reciprocal inhibition occurring. Okay? Um, what's most likely happening, and it's the whole idea of the PALES concept, is that the body is governing how much range of motion we all have based on your body's ability to recuperate itself or to recover from that range of motion. So once you get to the quote-unquote end range of motion, you're not at the end length of that tissue. There is a whole bunch more range of motion you could achieve, but your central nervous system is controlling that range of motion. It's only giving you a certain amount. When you contract, when you tell the person to contract against you, it's almost like you're showing the nervous system, we still have control over this range. So once you show them that for that six or eight second contraction and you get them to relax, the nervous system says, okay, if you can control this range, I am going to release the spindle sensitivity to allow you a little bit more range. And then you do it again, and then you do it again. It's very easy to prove you're not at the end range of motion because if you're doing a stretch, let's say you're stretching, you're growing your hamstring, when you think you're at your end of range of motion, like you said, you contract, you relax, you can go further. You're not ripping fibers, there's no, no damage is occurring, you're just playing with the nervous system's output. And that's the whole concept of tails is the idea that as you get stronger in those progressive ranges of motion, the nervous system will then start to incorporate those new ranges into everyday life. That's what I term useful flexibility. It's useless flexibility to be flexible after an hour-long yoga class. It's not like if you're in a situation, you have to hold on and stretch for an hour before I can do whatever I have to do. If you're about to fall and you need an increased range of motion, you don't have time to warm up. It's useless flexibility. But useful flexibility would be to train those outer ranges to achieve them even when you're cold. So it's impressive when somebody can do the splits when they're cold and not warmed up. To me, it's irrelevant that after an hour of long yoga class, you can then do the splits or show demonstrate flexibility. 
Any other questions about that? Okay. 